UNIDO stands for United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and I can assure you that there is not one single government on this planet who is not interested in industrialization. Everybody wants to have more industries, wants to produce more products, but I think it should be clear it has to be sustainable. So in December 2013, we got a new mandate, or a mandate it was more clearly spelled out, that it should be inclusive and sustainable industrial development. Maybe some of you remember last year I made a presentation on, on the more global outlook. And what we are facing in UNIDO is we need to scale up our activities. What I have heard today in the morning from UK, from these 20 companies, you know, they are only in a way moving towards resource or efficiency or eco-efficiency when they have some input from outside of course, is also valid for companies, SMEs, especially in Vietnam. What I have seen in this afternoon, you know, what are the barriers? I mean, it's just maybe a factor four more than in, in, in the countries. Unidos clients are all developing countries. So we work in countries like Mozambique, Egypt, Ukraine, Vietnam, China, Brazil, and so on. So we have millions of SMEs which have no clue about what eco-efficiency means. We started our what we called cleaner production, or now what we call resource efficient and cleaner production program 20 years ago. So we will celebrate our 20 years birthday this October in Davos, in Switzerland. In the meantime, it's a joint program with UNEP, United Nations Environmental Pro uh, Program. So it's a joint program. In the meantime, we have about 50 cleaner production centers built up all over the world. And in our recipe network, global network, we have at the moment 67 centers. And all of these centers have a different perfor performance and also a different background. But about 60 to 70% of these centers are in the meantime financially sustainable. And I think that's a great achievement in, when you consider the environment of these centers. Now, we have this problem of scaling up to do more with less resources. And so we designed, or I designed this project on industrial parks. As you may know, we have in Asia, and Asia is the powerhouse of manufacturing. We have thousands in China. We have more than 7,000 industrial parks. We have industrial parks in the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, South Korea, everywhere in Asia. This was really the, in a way, the tool for industrialization. And what we try now to do existing industrial parks, and you see one of here, they are very often not so environmental friendly. We try to move them towards what we call eco-industrial parks. I will come back. So eco-industrial parks, by the way, the definition is quite old. I think this is already 1997 from the Asian Development Bank. This is in a more general theoretical definition of an industrial park. But how do you achieve such an industrial park when you have already an existing one where companies, for example, were not planned, it was nothing planned and not nothing designed for an eco-industrial park? And if you go into the literature, you see there is one shining example of an industrial, eco-industrial park. It's Kalundborg in Denmark. Then there are a few in, mentioned in South Korea. China is claiming to have one or two. US is claiming to have one or two. UK is claiming to have one or two. But when you go and see them and really go in details, I think there is still a lot to do till we can claim that it is an eco-industrial park. In Vietnam, industrial parks play a very important role. First of all, industrialization was really the method to fight poverty. Vietnam was in 1990 a very, very poor country. Now they have brought down the level of poverty to about 15%, starting with about 75% in the 90s people who are living below 
with uh, less than one dollar per day. But it had also a price. There is a lot of environmental pollution, air pollution, water pollution, groundwater pollution, and of course I have a big problem with waste, not only municipal waste, but also industrial waste. But you can see industrial parks play a very important role. They are contributing about 35 or 38 percent to the GDP. I think in UK, the manufacturing industry at all is below 10 percent. So you can see the, the, uh, the uh, significance of, of this. Uh. But again, it has a huge price. 70% of the wastewater emitted by these industrial parks is not treated at all. And why? Because they introduced in the 90s a very smart rule. As long as an industrial park in the size, the area, has not more than 50% used for factories, they don't need a uh, wastewater treatment plant. The result was, whenever they came near to this 50%, they just added a few hectares more, and so no wastewater treatment plant. About 20% of the waste is hazardous waste, of industrial waste. But the, industri the waste management is, you know, you mix it with municipal waste, and you just dispose it in a dumping site. Normally, it's not even a proper landfill. And you can see, 2013, there were already 290 industrial parks. Few of them were not really well operated, but some of them are quite doing uh, well. We in UNIDA, we always need money for our projects. We need a donor, either we have a bilateral donor, a country who is financing it, or very often we have to, find, uh, to get projects by the Global Environmental Facility. The Global Environmental Facility has six windows, thematic windows. One is international water, climate change, chemicals management, biodiversity, land degradation, and uh, desertification. Now, for the first time, we managed to get a project which is in a it's an integrated approach, has an integrated approach, is not only focusing on energy efficiency, but or is looking also at the chemicals management, at the water management. So we got money from all these three thematic windows, climate change, chemicals, and international waters. Though it took us quite a long time to get it through because they were not used to this type of projects because it was not clear who is now the lead out of these three and how should we go. We are also combining, in a way, tools we have developed over the years within UNIDA. So one is this resource efficient and clean production approach, then transfer of environmental sound technologies, BAT, BEP for emission control, where we do quite a lot of in the Stockholm Convention, you know, for, for example, for unintentionally produced dioxins and furans. So we optimize the process by using BAT and BEP. And also for this time, we have quite a few innovative financial instruments. Here, for example, the Green Credit Trust Fund. What is innovative on this trust fund? If a company is investing, let's say, $100,000 into a project and they can prove that in, let's say, water consumption or energy consumption or production of, of hazardous waste, they can reduce the amount by at least 50% per ton of product they will get 25% of, of the loan as a grant from the first day. So it's very attractive for them to go for real, cleaner technology and not just for the cheapest technology, as it is normally the case. We have selected three industrial parks, of course, in negotiation with the government. One is in the north, one is in central Vietnam, and one is in the south, and you can see the number of companies uh, which are located on these three different industrial parks. What we do in the project, first of all now, we have to identify pilot projects within companies. So we need companies to do cleaner production. And for to be successful, and you will see later on, our success is clearly defined in how many tons of CO2 we are saving, how many cubic meters of wastewater we are reducing, how many milligrams or grams of dioxin and furan we are 
reducing, and so on. So for to, to get to these results, we need to have companies joining our resource efficient and cleaner production program, and we need to have at least 60 to 80 companies. So when I heard this morning, you know, what, what sort of problems you have for 20 companies, you can imagine what sort of problems we will have here in Vietnam, SMEs, to motivate them to do cleaner production in the next two, three years. We have to do a lot of capacity building because people don't know what it means. They don't see the benefit, they don't want to do it, so we do a lot of capacity building, but not only on the company level, but we have to do it also on the government level or on these industrial zone developers who are really the managers of these industrial parks. We try to also to do something on policy guidelines. As I said, we have to change these policy guidelines. You know that uh, wastewater treatment plants are only necessary when you have more than 50% of your area used by companies and so on. And last but not least, of course, we need to have a very strong monitoring and evaluation system because we have to prove at the end of the day how much we have reduced in all these different parameters. We have, in a way, three outputs planned. First of all, you know, on the company level. And to get all these reductions, we have to prove it by measurements. So we may have to make sure that companies now already start with the implementation of real practical measures or technologies. We cannot just calculate or plan it. We have to do it now. And of course, we have to start as soon as possible because it will take some time. We need to have a strategic plan for these three industrial zones because they all need to have common facilities like wastewater treatment plant. They need to have a waste management system. Maybe they need to have a new water supply system or energy. We maybe can replace some of the fossil fuel energy by renewable energy. And of course, we need also, this is in a way in the definition of an eco-industrial park, we need also to look at the communities, at the workers which are related to these industrial parks. So what are the biggest problems for the communities surrounding these industrial parks? And how can we really improve the situation there? You see here some of the practical activities now on the company level. I think this we have discussed already. Then on the industrial zone levels, we also try to convince these industrial zones developers that they should offer more services to the companies because they could do cleaner production consulting to the companies. They could help them, you know, to improve the efficiency in the production. It should be not done by us, by foreigners. It should be done by, by them themselves. And of course, it's also on the public community level. We have to do awareness raising in the communities. We have to find out what are the problems they experience. We see an industrial park and so on. And we have to have guidelines and so on. Capacity building, again, we have these two levels. One is on the institutional level. We need to train a lot of people also from the government. And here Vietnam has a very specific approach for industrial parks because they have industrial parks which are managed by the federal government, by the Ministry of Planning and Investment. But they have uh, quite a lot of industrial parks which are managed and supervised by the provincial government and some of them are even managed on the municipality level or town level. And then we have a few which are foreign managed and they are private owned and they're not, it's not clear who is really responsible. For example, what is also quite unique that here, I think in UK, everywhere, you know, the Ministry of Environment is in charge of controlling emissions of a company. In Vietnam, the Ministry of Environment can only control, in theory, the emissions of the industrial park, but not of the individual company. The individual company is controlled by the industrial zone developer. And they are not really interested to bother these people, you know, with this uh, compliance, so they just let it go. So we need to have also this capacity building there. And of course, of company level, we have seen it just in the afternoon, you know, lack of know-how, lack of 
know-how about what is the best available technology, what is the best environmental practice, how to do a feasibility study for a technology, how to do a financial viability study, how to write a financial proposal so you can go to a bank and ask for money is not uh, something uh, SMEs are at the moment able to do, so we have to teach and help them to do it. We have for the whole project, because Jeff is contributing about 3.5 million, we also received 1 million cash from a bilateral donor, so we have 4.6 million for to run the project, and we have from the Vietnamese side about 42 million dollar co-financing, which is signed through different funding mechanism so we can really implement technology. This funding mechanism, this co-financing is of course more loans, so they have to pay, it's a bank loan, so it's not a grant, but at least they have some uh, very uh, attractive, uh, let's say, interest rates, or as you have seen, if you are achieving certain results, you get 25% of the loan as a grant. Policy level, here you can see some of the uh, activities we are planning to do. We have to try to convince the government to come up with a very clear policy to manage these industrial parks, to manage these industrial parks in a uniform way through, all, through the whole country, but we also need to have guidelines and regulations for the future industrial parks and how we can maybe start planning so-called eco-industrial parks parks from the beginning, so then we don't need to clean up later on. And we have to help also this on the policy level, on the federal government, province level, municipality, but then of course also on the level of the industrial zones developers. You can see here, these are the uh, indicators we have to measure, and this is how at the end of the day the success or the failure of the project will be based on this uh, indicators. Where are we? Well, we got, and you can see this is quite amazing. We need, we had, after Jeff, in a way, accepted the pro proposal and in a way signed uh, the money, we needed the approval of the Prime Minister of Vietnam for such a project. It took us six months. We had the inception workshop in October 2014, and then we needed, that was an, uh, uh, quite a Astonishing for us, we needed also the project approved by the Minister of the Ministry of Planning and Investment. We also got it and now we are started. We have built up the project management unit. We do now the reassessment of the baseline because it's two and a half years ago when we started to design the project. And we start with, in August with the first kickoff meetings in all the different uh, industrial parks. Benefits, beneficiaries, I know these are the companies the industries located in, within these industrial parks, but I think there are also beneficiaries are the communities around, surrounding it, the local government, and of course the environment. And the benefits of the project is how we try to sell the project to the companies, to the governments, and to the industrial zone developers. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm more than happy if you have good ideas to help me to implement these projects and how to convince the companies. I'm here today evening and also tomorrow, so please contact me and give me your advice. Thank you very much.